Once billed as the king size version of Marilyn Monroe, Jane Mansfield has been called the blondest and the dumbest of the dumb blondes. The first mainstream star to appear nude on the silver screen in a starring role, Jane is often associated more with the gruesome details of her tragic death than the particulars of her career. A career that Jane made from nearly scratch built bit by bit from her sheer will and unrelenting determination to be a big star. Welcome, this is Beauty Biography, where every episode we explore the life of an iconic beauty while creating a loosely inspired makeup look. I like to think of it like Peter Graves Beauty Biography meets Bailey Sarian kind of mashed up. Today's episode is all about blonde bombshell Jane Mansfield, an underrated PR genius who met the tragic fate that cemented her status in history. Let's dive in. Jane Mansfield was born Vera Jane Palmer on April 19th, 1933. That means that Jane is an Aries. You knew I was gonna tell you, right? You knew I was gonna tell you her zodiac. So Aries are often associated with being passionate, bold, very determined, very motivated. And all of these are attributes that are definitely going to describe Jane. She was born in Bryn Mawr, Pennsylvania, which is a very beautiful, affluent suburb of Philadelphia. And she was the only child. So her father was Herbert William Palmer. He was a lawyer and her mother was Vera Jeffrey. While she was born in Pennsylvania, her family is gonna live in New Jersey when she's a young child, and she has a pretty happy childhood. She has two really great parents, but tragically, her father passes away when she's only three years old to a heart attack. It's very unexpected, and unsurprisingly, this has a very big effect on Jane. A lot of her friends and biographers would say that really her losing her father at such a young age led her to really crave male attention and affection and especially approval. That's just because she really had this kind of void left there. She actually describes that she had vivid memories of her dad, even though she was so young when he passed, she really remembered him. And I think she really idealized him in her mind because she was very young when he passed, but she really felt like he was a huge presence in her life even though she only had three years with him. When Jane is six years old, her mother remarries to a sales engineer named Harry Lawrence Pierce. Following the marriage, Jane and her mother move with Harry to Dallas, Texas. As a young girl and a teenager, Jane pretty much always knew she wanted to be a star. She idolized Shirley Temple. She would watch every Shirley Temple, movie, show, anything that Shirley Temple was in, she would watch and she would emulate. I can actually really relate to this because as a young girl, my Nana would show me Shirley Temple movies and I would just eat them up and I would do little performances, which is what Jane also did. So she would put on shows for her stuffed animals, her family members. She would sing, she would dance, she would play violin. She would sometimes even perform just for people, you know, passing by. She would go in her driveway and, and put on performances. So if you drove by, there she was performing <laughs> for anyone who was, you know, taking a walk or, or driving by. She really loved to perform from a very young age. Jane was also an incredibly kind child. And this is something that people would talk about for the rest of her life because she wasn't just a kind child. It you know, continued and followed her into adulthood. But one really sweet example from when she was a child was this little anecdote where when she was just small, there was another neighborhood family struggling financially. And Jane noticed that the little girl in the family did not have a winter coat. And so Jane, of her own volition, with no one telling her, went to this little girl and traded her own jacket for an old, completely unusable baby bottle. And I think that's really incredible that such a small child was that perceptive and that giving. It's really quite sweet. And it's an interesting contrast because you're gonna see later on, people really kind of thought that Jane was a little bit of this dumb blonde, but she was actually incredibly perceptive and incredibly intelligent about what other people wanted and needed. When Jane was 13, her family went on vacation to Hollywood 
which we've heard a lot of stars around this time kind of getting like the stardom bug when they went on vacation to Hollywood. So I think it was probably a very common family destination back in the day because you know this was like early days of Hollywood. So they tour one of the studios, the family does, and they go to lunch after the tour. And Jane is sitting there with her mother and she observes another girl asking a couple radio stars for their autographs. Jane looks at her mother and she says, you know what, one day it's gonna be little girls coming up to me asking me for my autograph. So from a very young age, she saw that fame and that celebrity as an aspiration. Some of Jane's idols, in addition to Shirley Temple, when she's around this age, included Hedy Lamarr, Jean Tierney, and Jean Harlow, all beauties that we've covered here before on Beauty Biography and all personal kind of idols of mine, especially, especially Jean Harlow. Oh my gosh. So Jane, you know, goes back to Texas and she has got this stardom bug really, really under her skin. She's gotta be a star. But this almost gets sidetracked a little bit because when Jane is only 16 years old, she is at a Christmas Eve party and she meets Paul Mansfield. The two really hit it off. Funny enough, when she met him, she was actually dating one of his friends, but you know, I guess nothing can stop young teenage love. Just one month after meeting Jane and Paul elope. Jane keeps this elopement a secret, mainly because at the time in Texas where they lived, if you got married, you could no longer go to high school. And Jane was really close to finishing high school and she wanted to finish. So they kind of keep this a secret, even from her parents. But then when Jane discovers she's pregnant, she has to come clean. At first, Jane's mother is furious with her. She goes as far as telling Jane, you know what? Never ask me for help. You're on your own, like you have ruined everything and while her mom does eventually come around jane says that it really always stuck with her that her mother's first reaction was that she was not going to help her and that she felt like she had ruined her life i think it's an important lesson <laughs> you know what it's easy to react to things that are big and scary i get that but especially with children and people that you love you really have to be careful about how you react because what you first say it leaves a big impression and you can never take words back even though you know you can work to rebuild trust or to rebuild that relationship the things you say in anger don't just go away when you come around so jane's family knows she's pregnant she comes clean about the elopement and then she and paul have a wedding with their families in may of that year now this is where the timelines are a little loopy and here's the thing whenever we're dealing with things that happened before the age of the internet there can often be conflicting stories people remember things differently and so some sources say that oh the first marriage between paul and jane like their first and only wedding was that one in may however jane's own estate maintains that Paul and Jane were married in January and then that this second wedding happened in May with all of their family. So that's the version we're gonna go with. Again, there can be a lot of conflicting stories, so I kind of just tend to go with whichever sources I find to be the most reliable. Following this second shotgun wedding in May, Jane and Paul's daughter, Jane Marie Mansfield, is born on November 8th, 1950. Now, you would think that becoming a teen mother would kind of derail Jane's ambitions, but it didn't. She was very, very happy to be a mother by all accounts. She loved being a mom, but she maintained her ambition to become a star. She was not going to let go of this dream. Again, a very, very determined woman. Jane and Paul both attended Southern Methodist University to study acting, and then they would later go to the University of Texas at Austin, where Jane gets involved in the theater. Now, after Paul graduates in 1952, the Korean War is happening, so Paul is called up into the Army Reserves. The family lives for a while at a military camp in Georgia, where Jane was often kind of seen as uh, somewhat of a distraction. She was very voluptuous, as we all probably know. She was a very voluptuous young woman, very beautiful, and she would often sunbathe by the pool. And yeah, it distracted a lot of the troops. Actually, Paul says that at one point, one of the officers told him, hey, why don't you have her come sunbathe at the officer's pool instead? So, you know, it was a distraction, but it was not an unwelcome distraction. 
While on base, Jane gets involved in some theater groups that they have there at Camp Gordon in Georgia. She appears in a production of Anything Goes, but I don't think anyone's gonna be surprised to hear. That's not really the kind of career Jane is aspiring to. She has not forgotten that she is going to Hollywood. She doesn't just wanna be, you know, practicing her craft of acting. She wants to be a movie star. So when it's time for Paul to actually go to Korea, he tells her, when I get back from Korea, we as a family will move to Hollywood, I promise. And Jane is like, all right, good, because that's where I want to be. Jane really had like this incredible amount of confidence. So she knew she was going to make it. She knew she was gorgeous. She knew she had talent. They would say that she would look in the mirror and she knew that she had the face and the body of a star and she was not gonna take no for an answer. I think that's pretty refreshing to hear because so many of the beauties we've covered are just these gorgeous, talented women that really second guess themselves a lot. And Jane, that was not her. She had the confidence. Paul goes to Korea and when he gets back in 1954, the family, as promised, does move to California. Once in Hollywood, Jane decides that rather than wait for her big break, she's gonna make it happen herself. So she arranges to have a photo of herself in a bikini printed on the front page of a large newspaper in Los Angeles. Two weeks after this, it works. Jane is declared Miss Fire Prevention Week, which you know what? It's a start, okay? She is here to make her own luck and she's not gonna stop. Jane's first screen test is in April of 1954 for Paramount Pictures. And this is incredible to me because Jane actually selects to do a monologue from Joan of Arc. Now, I'm not sure if I've ever mentioned this, but the entire kind of inspiration for Beauty Biography came from this school project that I did when I was in school, where we got to pick historical figures, dress up like them, and do a presentation on their life, like present their biography. Well, my favorite one that I did, and my most memorable one, was Joan of Arc. So I thought that was a very incredible coincidence. Now, that said, after Jane performs, you know, her very dramatic Joan of Arc monologue, the Hollywood executive that she had performed for, he says to her, you know what? You are, quote, wasting your obvious talents, meaning her good looks and her ample bosom. So as Jane puts it, the studio lightens her hair and tightens her dresses. It's just the classic, Hollywood makeover, every starlight got one. And let's be honest, I kind of wouldn't mind having one. I just love a good makeover montage. So I don't actually get that mad at them, except for, you know, the ones that were like really over the top. But Jane's, I don't think was. I think it was mostly just lightening her hair. We'll never know. She has her makeover and Jane starts putting that new image to work. She opens herself up to basically like any publicity that's available. She becomes Miss Peanut Butter and Jelly, Miss Uranium, the Blue Bonnet Belle of Texas. Like if there is a gimmick, she will put her face and name on just about any opportunity. The blonde bombshell at this point had become a big trope in Hollywood. I mean, it was a big thing. You had the success of Marilyn Monroe. And whereas Marilyn Monroe and the other blonde beauties of the time kind of shied away from the spotlight sometimes, Jane leaned into the spotlight. She was drawn to it with almost an insatiable appetite. She was just certain that that was going to be her road to fame. Now, during this time of Jane's public profile picking up, Jane and Paul do end up divorcing. Paul admits that he knew Jane was going to be a star and he just basically decided that he didn't wanna take a back seat to her budding fame. He didn't wanna be Mr. Jane Mansfield. Now, despite the divorce, Jane decides to keep the last name Mansfield because she thought that Jane Mansfield sounded like the name of a star and to her credit, she was correct. Throughout this whole biography, you were just gonna see that she was very savvy at getting herself media attention. 
Now, with Paul gone, you might be worried about how Jane's gonna survive, but don't worry, because the thing is, Jane had actually inherited a pretty hefty trust fund from her grandparents. So she had inherited what would be about $1.3 million today. So she was living off that, but she also used it to help create her image. She really wanted to just kind of find a niche and a very recognizable brand for herself. So Jane adopts the color pink as like her trademark and she styles herself with a lot of heart-shaped jewelry, heart-shaped patterns. She's basically like pink and hearts. That's her brand. She goes as far as buying a pink Jaguar so people can really, you know, see her coming. Her new image is successful, but obviously she has to like get it out there more. So she actually starts setting up some publicity stunts. She ends up pioneering the wardrobe malfunction. We all remember that term from like the Super Bowl. So she kind of pioneers that when she goes to this press junket for a Jane Russell film called Underwater with an exclamation point. The press junket is being held at this hotel that has a pool and Jane purposefully wears a too small bikini. That way, when she dives into the pool in full view of all these photographers, her top comes off and there's all these people there to take pictures of it and write all about it in all of the newspapers. And it makes a pretty big splash. Haha, <laughs> pardon my pun. The stunt actually leads to her posing in Playboy and getting an offer from Warner Brothers. So Jane signs with Warner Brothers but it's not exactly the success she's hoping it's going to be. She does get a few bit parts in movies, including Female Jungle and Illegal. Her co-stars describe her as being very talented and a pleasure to work with, but they don't really go anywhere, and pretty soon those bit parts dry up. So Jane, ever determined, decides, you know what, that's fine, I'm gonna switch up my tactics. Her next move is to actually return to her theater roots with her Broadway debut. She appears in the show Will Success Spoil Rock Hunter. In the show, she plays a siren, dumb blonde part that had originally been offered to Mamie Van Doren. Now the role was meant to be like a satire of Marilyn Monroe and Mamie said basically she had decided that she was really trying to distance herself from that image. She had really been kind of seen as like a Marilyn Monroe light version and she was trying to distance herself and kind of make a name for herself that wasn't associated with Marilyn. Jane, on the other hand though, she embraced being seen as similar to Marilyn. This makes Jane perfect for the role of Rita Marlowe. Now the show does initially get pretty awful reviews. <laughs> and while the rest of the cast is downtrodden about this, Jane is just ecstatic to be in the spotlight. She's ecstatic that she's even mentioned in the papers, even though it's in a bad critical review. She doesn't care. To her, any publicity is good publicity and she is starting to get an inordinate amount of press coverage. Now, during all the interviews for this show, Will Success Spoil Rock Hunter, Jane basically stays in character, portraying herself as this caricature of Marilyn Monroe. Now, conveniently enough, right around the time that Jane is starring in Will Success Spoil Rock Hunter and you know portraying herself as this caricature, Marilyn Monroe herself is having some difficulties. So 20th Century Fox is really struggling to get Marilyn to work. This is around that time where she's having a lot of personal troubles and those are definitely spilling over and affecting her work. If you saw the Marilyn Monroe beauty biography that we did on the channel, you'll remember there's a period of time where Marilyn basically refuses to work. Well, because of this, 20th Century Fox is looking for someone to basically be the successor to Marilyn. And they see Jane and they think that could work. So they sign Jane to a six year contract. Now, usually these contracts are seven years. So I don't, I don't know what went different here, but you heard me right. It was a six year contract. Now Jane's first starring role is as Jerry Jordan in The Girl Can't Help It. The film is released in December of 1956 and it becomes a big success. 
both critically and financially. The film ends up earning even more than 1953's Gentlemen Prefer Blondes, which was helmed, of course, by Marilyn herself. The success of this film leads Fox to start billing Jane as Marilyn Monroe king size. They are playing on the fact that she is very similar to Marilyn, but she is even more well-endowed, even more voluptuous. And this is two-prong. They wanna promote Jane, but also they're hoping that by promoting Jane this way, they're gonna kind of needle Marilyn into coming back to work. So they're using Jane as leverage here, which leads to a bit of tension between Jane and Marilyn, almost completely from Marilyn's end. You know, Jane thinks Marilyn's great. Marilyn is kind of almost offended and annoyed that she's being almost mocked, she feels. Now Jane next wants to do a dramatic role, and so Fox casts her in the film The Rayward Bus, which is actually a adaptation of a John Steinbeck novel. It's a very dramatic film, a dramatic role, and Jane is hoping it's going to establish her as a serious actress. There's a little bit of success in that aspiration because she does win a Golden Globe that year in 1957 for New Star of the Year. She actually ends up beating out Carol Baker and Natalie Wood for the award. Later that year, her Broadway show, Will Success Foil Rock Hunter, is adapted into a movie and Jane reprises her role. She also stars alongside Tony Randall and Joan Blondell. All the while that Jane is starring in these movies and getting these roles, she does not let up on her publicity blitz. Like she wants to make sure that she is staying in the papers, staying in the media. Her strategy includes regular appearances in Playboy magazine. She actually would pose every February from 1957 to 1964. So for what, seven years there, she was basically the Valentine playmate. This was a way that Jane liked to keep herself in the press. So, you know, every February you knew you were gonna see Jane in Playboy. Jane also once appeared on the cover of Life magazine twice in one year, which at the time was nearly unheard of. She even went on this press tour where she met Queen Elizabeth II. So Jane was constantly making sure that she was staying in the public eye. She knew that kind of, you know what, the second that she was out of the media, someone else could come and replace her and she was not gonna let that happen. Now in 1957, Jane appears in Kiss Them For Me opposite Cary Grant, which, hello, incredible opportunity to star opposite Cary Grant. But unfortunately, the film is a flop. And Fox, rather than blame Cary Grant, who was, you know, very well established, they decide to blame Jane for this flop. So Fox executives kind of start to back off of promoting Jane. Jane does not take kindly to media silence, so she actually ends up orchestrating one of the most famous publicity stunts ever. Now, I had no idea this was even a publicity stunt, but there is this infamous picture of Jane with Sophia Loren at a dinner that was being held in Sophia's honor to welcome her to Hollywood. We actually talked about this dinner in the beauty biography for Sophia. At this dinner, Jane, on purpose, wore a too small dress to the party so that her cleavage would kind of spill out and distract attention away from Sophia and onto herself. At one point in the party, she even like leans over to expose one nipple and there are actual photos taken of that, which is, I don't know. This one I think was a little too far. It did get Jane a lot of media coverage, but it was really finally like kind of that turning point of when too much publicity becomes oversaturation. It was just one too many wardrobe malfunctions and you know, Sophia Loren was being welcomed to Hollywood. So it was really like the equivalent of wearing white to someone else's wedding. Fox did go on to cast Jane in The Sheriff of Fractured Jaw, but that would actually be Jane's last mainstream film success. Now, while all this is going on in the 50s, Jane's love life has taken an important turn. So in 1956, while Jane was attending the Mae West Review, she laid eyes on Mickey Hargitay, and Mickey Hargitay laid eyes on her. He was actually one of Mae West's stable of hunks, so he was performing in the Mae West Review, and it's said that the two locked eyes, and it was love at first 
sight. Mickey was actually a former Mr. Universe and a Hungarian immigrant. Now there are some reports that Mae West was kind of annoyed by the fact that Jane and Mickey fell in love. Allegedly, Mae at one point told Mickey to break things off with Jane and also to rebuke her publicly in the press, but he did not do that. <laughs> Instead, he publicly professed his love for her and the two of them got married in 1958. Their wedding actually took place in a glass chapel and it was attended by fans and press. They made it a very, very public affair. We see so many celebrities at the time that would again, lean away from making their personal life public. Jane consistently leaned into being a celebrity. To her, publicity was her currency. Jane and Mickey's first child together was born in December of 1958. He was named Miklos, or more commonly referred to as Mickey Hargitay Jr. He would be followed by brother Zoltan in August of 1960, and then the famous in her own right, Mariska Hargitay, was born to the couple in January of 1964. The family made their home at Jane's Pink Palace on Sunset Boulevard in LA. This was a home that Jane had actually purchased in 1957 and had completely refurbished with pink paint, pink fixtures, pink furniture. She would write to furniture and building suppliers and ask them for free pink samples and she used those to turn this into this pink palace. Mickey himself, he even built a pink heart-shaped swimming pool himself by hand. He did that for her. So, I mean, kind of really sweet. Now, sadly, the mansion was demolished in 2002, but before then it had been purchased by a couple other celebrities, including Ringo Starr and Engelbert Humperdinck who's like a big famous singer, if you didn't know. Now in the late 1950s, because of her pregnancies, Jane was unable to star in the types of roles that Fox had become accustomed to putting her in. Not only that, they still were kind of unhappy about the box office flops, so her career stalled a little bit. And again, there was also that negative backlash against her penchant for publicity stunts. This kind of took its toll on her star power on the silver screen. So to refresh her waning career, Jane set out for Las Vegas, where she had a residency at the Tropicana with her new nightclub review. This actually made her one of the first stars to take up a regular show in Las Vegas. Jane was making a lot of money from Las Vegas. I mean, around like $200,000 in today's money a week. But by the early 1960s, she was really started to be seen as kind of a has-been. Now, there's a lot of factors to this, you know, coming from her own career, but also there was a cultural element. So the 1960s saw this shift away from the voluptuous figure as the gold standard and a more waifish appearance started to be seen as more appealing. On top of that, the culture was also starting to kind of shift away from glamour and diamonds as a girl's best friend into more of like a relaxed bohemian style. Those new trends obviously did not align very well with Jane's already very well established image. Additionally, the death of Marilyn Monroe in 1962 further contributed to the decline of the blonde bombshell in Hollywood. This was bad news for Jane. She had worked very hard to establish herself as a blonde bombshell, and now that was going out of style in the zeitgeist. You know, it's something that kind of was a double-edged sword because she had done such a good job creating her brand image, but then once it was out of style, she was kind of left a little bit high and dry. Jane turned to making guest appearances on television. Now, every time she would appear on a TV show or a late night show, the ratings would spike in large part because Jane never shied away from like making fun of herself. People saw her as this caricature of Marilyn Monroe and she would lean into it. She did not mind being the butt of the joke. She didn't mind being the punchline. Now seeing that her ratings on shows were so high when she would make guest appearances, a studio actually offered her the role of Ginger in Gilligan's Island, which would have been perfect for Jane Mansfield. But Jane turned it down. She felt like she was a movie star, not a TV star. But more than that, it just wasn't enough money. 
At the time, Jane was making about $25,000 a week appearing at nightclubs with her review, which is a lot of money then, but especially when you consider the fact that in 2023, that's almost $250,000. So really for Jane, it came down to money. She wasn't gonna make that much money being a regular on you know, a TV series. She decided to stick with nightclubs and promotional appearances. She would often open supermarkets, cut ribbons, things like that. She remained incredibly effective at self-promotion. Now, in 1963, Jane starred in Promises, Promises, which was mostly impactful for the fact because Jane appeared nude, and this made her the first mainstream American actress to appear nude in a starring role. Playboy, again, was one of Jane's preferred publicity outlets, and they ended up publishing nude photos of Jane from the set of that movie in June of 1963, and those are the photos that actually led to Hugh Hefner being charged with obscenity in Chicago. The film Promises Promises ended up being banned in Cleveland, Ohio and some other markets because of the nudity, but it did enjoy some middling success elsewhere. Really the main interest that people had in it was because Jane was nude. Now her appearance in Promises Promises led to Jane being selected to replace Marilyn Monroe in the film Kiss Me Stupid opposite Dean Martin. However, Jane was pregnant with her child, Mariska, at the time, so she chose to turn down the role and it eventually went to Kim Novak. While Jane was still pregnant with Mariska, she and Mickey actually divorced. Mickey had really expected that Jane would grow out of being so strong-willed and independent and, you know, just kind of doing whatever for publicity and, you know, everyone else's opinion be darned. But it just was not going to happen. Jane had really always been so confident in what she was doing and she felt like it had worked for her. So she was going to continue to be herself unapologetically. In addition to that, probably another big hiccup in the marriage was the fact that there were certainly several affairs that did not help the situation, including allegedly Jane having a couple affairs with both JFK and his brother Robert, hopefully separately. She also had an affair with an Italian director named Enrico Bamba. I'm not sure if Mickey had any affairs. It's possible, but oof. Following the divorce and the birth of Mariska, Jane started a singing career, but it did not take off. And then in 1964, the same year that Mariska was born, Jane married Matt Simber, who was a producer and director. He actually ended up managing her career throughout their marriage. This time, Jane's wedding was low key. It was not in a crystal glass palace for everybody to see. <laughs> it was a low key affair, and the couple had a son, Anthony, Jane's youngest child, child and her fifth the following year. Following the birth of Anthony, Jane struggled to lose the weight that she had gained while pregnant. Now, in the past, she'd been able to lose weight pretty quickly, and I think it's just probably because of her age. You know, the older you get, <laughs> your metabolism slows down a little bit, so Jane would hide her weight gain behind the more loose-fitting styles of the 60s. But what bothered her most was that she continued to have career setbacks. She could not land movie roles that were of any substance. And so to help herself cope, she ended up turning to alcohol and she developed a dependency. Her husband at the time, Matt Simber, he tried to help her step away from the alcohol, but ultimately he was not successful. The way he put it, she just was more strong-willed than he was. All of this took a big toll on their marriage and the two ended up divorcing in 1966. Now, during the divorce process, Jane did something that you should absolutely never, ever, ever do. And that is she began an affair with her divorce attorney. This was gonna turn out to be probably the worst decision of Jane's life. Jane's divorce lawyer was named Sam Brody, and they have this affair, and Sam actually ends up leaving his successful law practice, leaving his wife and his children to follow Jane. Not surprisingly, this turns out to be a pretty toxic relationship. 
both Jane and Sam abused alcohol and they would get into these knockdown, drag out fights that led to Sam being physically abusive. Now Jane was on these nightclub tours and she actually had the entire UK leg of her nightclub tour canceled because the promoters said that things were just so bad that they could not count on her to follow through and perform. And what was even worse is she had like black and blue bruises all over her legs and they basically didn't know how she was even gonna perform in these you know, short costumes with her legs completely bruised. Now Jane loved her children and so she often took them when she was able on tour with her, whenever Mickey would let her. However, her oldest daughter, Jane Marie, was really just with her almost all the time and Jane Marie was older than the three middle children. And so Jane Marie was around Sam a lot more than the rest of Jane's children. Now one day, Jane Marie walks into a Los Angeles police department claiming that she has been beaten by Sam Brody, her mother's boyfriend. There's pictures taken and it's well documented, the welts and the bruises, and I'm very glad that Jane Marie got away, but it makes me incredibly frustrated that Jane herself didn't stand up for or help Jane Marie. She should have stood up for her daughter. I'm sure that a big part of that was honestly the fact that she was abusing alcohol and being abused herself, but still such a mistake on Jane's part. And it really weighed on her. You know, Jane was only 17 years old when she had Jane Marie. So now that Jane Marie is no longer with her, her career is in the gutter. She's struggling with alcohol abuse. She's struggling with physical abuse at the hands of Sam Brody. Her life is in a complete tailspin. She has no consistency and no one there to ground her. It's a bad place to be and things are about to take a final turn for the worse. Now 1967, Jane stars in her last living role. It's a small cameo in the film, A Guide for the Married Man. It is a very exploitative role and at this point, Jane had pretty much resigned herself to the idea that that was all that was left for her. So she stars in these like small cameos that really just play upon that image that Jane had created, but reducing it down to a caricature, a stereotype with no real substance. With no other real movie offers, Jane decides to hit the road with her nightclub show to pay her bills. Now, up until this point, she had been you know, playing places like Las Vegas, New York, going to Europe, but she begins to play smaller and smaller cities and venues. So on June 28th of 1967, Jane had two appearances at a supper club in Biloxi, Mississippi, which again, it's no Broadway. Jane was still with Sam Brody at this point, which again, huge, huge, huge mistake. So she does these two shows at the supper club and she's supposed to go up here in New Orleans on like a local show the next day. So rather than stay the night in Biloxi, they need to get to New Orleans. So her, Sam Brody, and her three children with Mickey, Mickey Jr., Zoltan, and Mariska, who are with her, all get in the car with her driver and they go to New Orleans. They're on the way to New Orleans and around about 2.25 a.m., their driver, Ronnie Harrison, who's only 20 years old at the time, he's driving the Buick that they're riding in on US Highway 90. He's falling behind a tractor trailer, but for whatever reason, he fails to see that the tractor trailer in front of them is slowing down pretty rapidly because of an approaching insecticide truck. Ronnie, traveling at this high rate of speed on the highway, doesn't see the slowdown and he crashes into and rear ends this tractor trailer at a very high speed. Now, when the police arrived to the scene of the crash, they discovered three things. Number one, the Buick that they had all been riding in was so badly damaged that the cops at first thought it was a convertible the top was completely sheared off. So they thought this was like an accident with a convertible. Number two, they found that all three adults who had been sitting in the front seat, Ronnie, Sam, and Jane, had been killed immediately upon impact. There was 
no surviving what happened. But number three, they find that Jane's three children had all been asleep in the back seat at the time of the crash. All three of the children were still alive with only minor injuries. So at the scene of the crash on June 29th, 1967, Jane Mansfield is declared dead at the age of only 34 years. Jane's death was sensationalized almost immediately when reports start to circulate pretty quickly that Jane had been decapitated in the accident. This is not true, though it did become somewhat of an urban legend. This rumor or urban legend had started because of the police photos of the crash, which for some awful reason were made public to the press and to the public. And in those photos, you could see that the top of the car had been completely taken off. And there was something in the windshield tangled that resembled a blonde haired head, but it was not Jane's head. It's never been definitively determined what it was, but the most likely explanation is that it was a wig that Jane was wearing or had in the car or perhaps even indeed some of her hair that had been pulled from her head. Regardless of what it was, it does just go to show how yet again, we have a true tragedy that's taken and aggrandized unnecessarily. What happened on its own was so, so tragic. It didn't need extra gruesome details to be added. Now, even worse than the urban legend though, is the fact that the Buick that Jane was riding in was actually bought by a collector. And at one point it was made into a roadside attraction in Florida, which is sickening in my opinion. I don't understand the appeal of going to see a car that someone died in. It's just kind of sick. Now, one little silver lining, aside from the fact, obviously, that Jane's children survived, is the fact that after the accident, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, that's a mouthful, they called for the requirement of an underside guard on all tractor trailers. Now, that would basically prevent what happened to Jane's car from happening to someone else, where, you know, the top of the car went under the tractor trailer and got sheared off. That would prevent that from being able to happen in the future. So now, Nowadays, that is required on all tractor trailers. I think we've all seen that bar if you live in the US and I think it's great that it's required. But what I don't love is that that bar is now sometimes called a Mansfield bar. I just feel like it's somewhat gruesome to call it that. And honestly, I'm never going to look at that bar the same ever again. On July 3rd, 1967, Jane's funeral was held in Penn Argyle, Pennsylvania, near where she was born. Jane was laid to rest beside her beloved father, Herbert Palmer, at the wishes of Mickey Hargitay. A judge had actually declared Mickey and Jane's divorce as void, which made Mickey the official widower of Jane Mansfield and the executor of her estate. Now, there were not many big Hollywood names at Jane's funeral. Hollywood at this point had kind of turned their backs on Jane. And to be honest, they had never really treated her as one of them to begin with. They had kind of always looked at her as this caricature, this kind of joke, this, you know, knockoff of Marilyn Monroe. But there were nearly a thousand fans in attendance at Jane's funeral. By all accounts of the family, the fans that showed up were incredibly respectful of Jane and the whole funeral and the family themselves, which really brings it full circle for me. Because if you recall, at 13 years old, Jane had told her mother that one day she would be the person that people wanted an autograph from. She accomplished that. That was her aspiration, that she be a star in the eyes of the people. And it really begs the question, what makes a star a star? Is it the press? Is it the studios? Is it how well your movie does at the box office? Is it how much money they pay you? Is it how long your contract is? Or is it the fans, people like you and me? Because here we are on Beauty Biography almost 60 years after Jane's passing, talking about the beauty the humanity and the impact of Jane Mansfield. Like we talked about, Jane was a woman who never minded the joke being on her. So it was really easy for some people in Hollywood, maybe most of the people in Hollywood, 
to think that all Jane was was a joke. But those people were wrong. Jane was a force. She was a tireless worker. She was determined. She was a calculated PR maven who could make the press jump at any stunt she pulled. She was a woman with a kind heart and she was a mother of five. But before she was all of those things, she was Vera Jane Palmer, a little girl with a big dream of being a big star. And she made it happen. If you enjoyed this episode of Beauty Biography, be sure to hit the thumbs up and the subscribe button so that you will see me pop up in your YouTube feed whenever we have a new beauty biography. You can also check out our beauty biography playlist that has all the episodes of beauty biography that we have shared so far, including Lauren McCall, Rita Hayworth, and more. As always, let me know in the comments below which beauty you'd like to see in the next episode. And until then, you take care of yourself. Bye.